thank you all for choosing to join Project APHIS-M um, for our first webinar this year. We have several great speakers and we're excited to see you all here. We know there's a lot of options going on during National Pollinator Week for webinars. I want to turn your attention to the chat function. I'll be monitoring this chat during the presentation. If you have any questions for the speaker, go ahead and type it into the chat. Billy has let me know that he's happy to stay on for additional time after the webinar to answer as many questions as you may have. So thank you, Billy. Um, I also want to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded. If you would like a copy of the recording, there's a link in the chat function where you can sign up for our newsletter and we'll send it to you that way. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Billy, who will kick us off and talk about Seats for Bees. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Grace, for that introduction. Um, this is a supposed to be a very brief webinar, uh, just some some broad bullet points to kind of inform some people and uh, get them excited. So uh, this is about informing you of what you may not understand about cover crops or the research around it or the Seeds for Bees program or bee friendly farming. So um, definitely looking to get through a lot of information and get your questions answered at the end. So Project APSM is a nonprofit organization. We get our name from the, the Latin name, the scientific name of the Western honeybee, Apis mellifera. There we go. Um, we are a, a nonprofit that really tries to work at the intersection of commercial beekeeping and, and agriculture, commercial agriculture. It's the way we can uh, really be the most efficient and affect the most amount of bees um, where they need it most in, in, in addressing the, the issues that uh, that is impacting them and our food system as well. So I'm going to talk about the Seeds for Bees program. This is a program here in California. And it, it's 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 a three-pronged approach. I'd like you to think about it. It's about helping out bees, feeding bees, about improving the soil, and about educating and assisting growers to try something that they maybe haven't tried before. And so why is nutrition so important? In, in, or more specifically, for this slide, why are bees having issues? And we talk about the four P's, pests, pathogens, uh, incidental pesticide use, and poor nutrition. What's really great about the Seeds for Bees program and, and, and you know, what, what makes my job really fun is that that fourth P, that poor nutrition, helps mitigate the other negative uh, Peas, the pest, the pathogen, and the pesticides. So you can kind of address all of those uh, just by making sure that bees have access to adequate amounts and diversity of forage. So uh, we have Amelie Gaudin. She's going to talk about more about uh, soil health, and uh, Alina Nino is going to talk more about bee health, but I want to just touch on a few things real quick. So we all know that hives, when they have access to adequate amounts of forage, they are much healthier. Each individual bee is heavier and stronger, making for better pollinators. Uh, the um, They are better able to uh, fight off disease. They have better immune systems if they have adequate access to uh, the whole suite of necessary amino acids. They communicate better. Uh, the foragers are literally uh, doing their their uh, doing their dances and communicating where resources are important resources are more efficiently if they have access to that forage. 
but why does that really matter to the grower? Like why would a, a almond grower, for example, in California, uh, uh, want to plant forage? A lot of growers understand the healthier they, the bees leave the orchard, the more likely they are uh, to, to, to be healthy when they come back. But there's a more specific and immediate reason, and it's what I call the positive feedback loop. So as hives get brought to California, they are looking for signs of spring. They may have came from a place that's fairly warm, like Florida. They may have came from a place that's very, very cold, and they were just uh, clustering and, and, and not really active for the whole winter. So they come out to California. Uh, it's, it's sunny. It's fairly warm. And so they're going to, to fly around. They're going to have uh, be incentivized. So they're looking for signs of spring, like day length and temperature but they're also looking for pollen availability. So as that first bit of pollen comes into the hive in the spring, that tells uh, the bees inside the hive, the queen, that, hey, there are resources available. I can start laying eggs, and she starts laying eggs, up to 2,000 eggs a day. And uh, in three days' time, those eggs hatch into larvae. Well, that larvae has a pheromone, and it, and it cues other bees in the hive to, to do various tasks, but one of them is to go forage. So that larvae gives off a smell, gives off a pheromone to go tell the adult bees in the hive, you've got a whole lot of, you know, a whole cohort of bees coming on, your, your population is gonna increase, go get that precious nectar and pollen and bring it back and feed those bees. And as that happens, more eggs get laid, more larvae emerges, and the stronger that pheromone is. So this positive feedback loop will continue to happen as long as there's forage out there. And let's say, for example, uh, the first available forage for them is almond bloom the second week of February. So they're gonna start that, that process of building their population and becoming more robust. Anyhow, with the almond bloom, when it when it happens, but with these cover crops, if you can get these cover crops blooming a couple of days, a couple of weeks, maybe even more than a month before that almond bloom, when your bees are dropped on site, they're going to start this positive feedback loop on that cover crop. And then when you're cash crop is ready, for example, the almonds, they're gonna be uh, just attacking those blossoms in much more efficient. So that's why it, uh, it matters really to growers to get those bees uh, fed and going before, during, and even after the almond bloom. In addition to stronger colonies, of course, uh, there is benefits to the soil. Amelie is gonna expand on this, but things like improved organic matter, prevents erosion, increases water infiltration. In our survey that we fill out, this is the number one reason to that growers want to plant cover crops is water infiltration. Increase nitrogen, suppress weeds, uh, suppress nematodes, help with uh, your sanitation, mummy nuts, and reduce ground cracking. You know, the, the, the organic matter is, is important. 1% organic matter in your soil can hold 19,000 gallons of water. So that's, um, you, you, your soil has a better water holding capacity with more organic matter. So moving on to the Seeds for Bees program, you have uh, four different seed options to choose from. First year enrollees get $2,000 worth of free seed, and the second year enrollees get $1,000 worth of free seed. You always get free shipping and you get to, to call me and bother me with as, as many questions as you want. I like to do uh, site visits and you know, I provide technical advice. Now, you may be wondering how many acres does $2,000 cover? It really depends on what seed mix you select and this planting rate that you use. Um, if it can be anywhere from about 50 to 110, 120 acres of planted cover crop. 
So typically growers are doing maybe 25% up to 50%. So say for example, you had a six foot wide drill on 24 foot spacing. Uh, that's 25%. So a hundred acres of cover crop seed would be enough for a 400 acre block of, of almond trees, for example. So some, some guidelines uh, reside in California. You complete the online application. I'll have a link to that later. Um, grow honeybee pollinated crops. If you don't, that's okay. We've worked with many uh, walnut pistachio growers, for example. Just, you know, kind of explain about, uh, you don't rent bees, but, you know, why are you trying to help out uh, bees? And there's an opportunity for that in the, the application. Uh, you submit two photos, just because I, like to see how it's uh, working and sometimes I share those photos and then complete a short annual survey. And the, la the, the kind of the last step um, after you're filling out that application is a one-on-one -on -one with, with me where we figure out all this, this finer details. So just um, going a little bit over my time, just wanted to show some, some photos of the, the mustard mix. This is gonna be the mix that is going to bloom before almonds if planted uh, on time and ideally you want to plant for second week of October. You know that's probably okay for your maybe earlier harvested varieties but that may be too early for some of your later ones. The clover mix, the clover option, that's not even going to start blooming until after the almond Um, And then we have the soil builder. This was a mix that This was a mix that we uh, developed last year and had a lot of good success with it. I changed a few things around uh, this year. Um, it kind of, it, it does a little of everything. Pretty, pretty exciting. Next, there's um, some other photos of it as well. Um, and I just wanted to include some photos. If everybody could put themselves on mute, that'd be Great. I hear some noise there in the background. Um, this is a grower in series. As you can see, you know, there's you, you don't necessarily have to, to buy expensive equipment. Drilling is very nice, but there's very uh, workable options with broadcast seeding. So as you can see, they, they put a broadcast seeder, just a basic one, on the front of their uh, ATV there. Um, you see those two little uh, uh, bits of canvas that are keeping it kind of more in, in the center rows. And as you can see, uh, that soil is pretty loose. See those tire tracks, you see some dog prints. If your soil is that loose, you may not necessarily have to do some ground prep. Uh, but after you broadcast it, you can't just leave it on top of the ground. You need to um, cover it up a little bit. And then you can see uh, that they're just using a piece of chain link fence to kind of drag some soil over it and cover it up. And, uh, you know, this great grower is able to do it in one pass. They're broadcasting on the front, covering it up in the back. And here are the results um, that was taken, I think, very early March. Um, you don't, you know, you can be creative too. Now you get a whole lot of more soil benefits if you plant in the orchard versus next to it. But if, if, if next to the orchard is all you can do, that works too, the bees will find it. So it was again, planted with this custom broadcaster and then there were the results. Um, I just wanna to touch briefly on competition. Uh, there's some, some, I have some documents, there's some great research already out there that's showing that the cover crops will not decrease your yield, it won't decrease your pollination potential, the bees aren't going to be occupied with the cover crop and not in your orchard. Um, that, that is not a factor, in fact, we're finding that this almost helps anchor your bees to that orchard and not, not go elsewhere, not go to the neighbor's orchard and so on. You know, and I, I, I want you guys to know anybody that's especially new to the program, 
know that this is it's a program for you and it's 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 supposed to be there to help you out now i know a decent amount about cover crops i f feel like i make fairly good recommendations but the recommendations I'm going to make after meeting you, even after doing a site visit, is not nearly going to be as good as, as the recommendations you're going to be able to make for yourself after you try it out a few times. And that's, I think, the beauty of Seeds for Bees is it allows the grower to try some things out, to tweak a few things for a couple of years so they find out what what's works best for them. So if you need to mow it down because you're concerned for some reason, if you planted late, then you told me hey. if you, um, you know, if, if, if there's some sort of issue, just talk to me. That's totally OK. It's this program is meant to, uh, you know, it, we are working with you and um, I'm always here to answer any questions. And so the application, the online application is open now. Um, you can just Google Seeds for Bees. You can go to that link. There'll be some documents that we'll be able to share. Grace will I'll put uh, some additional links uh, in the chat, I'm sure. And there will be some time at the end for questions for uh, me or any of the other speakers. The next speaker we have is Alina Nino from UC Dick. All right, are you ready, Alina? Alina, are, are you there? We can't hear you. Maybe I'm thinking we should switch to Amelie. And yeah, let's do that and we can circle back. Thanks, Ellie. Alrighty, so next up is Amelie Gaudin from UC Davis. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to thank Project Apis for putting this, this webinar together and for the opportunity to share with you some thoughts around cover crop. Um, in this um, talk, I will focus as cover crop as a soil health practice and mostly focus in almond. Um, it has been less commonly researched despite it, its dominance across our agricultural landscape. But this is where cover crops can have real benefits for pollination and bee health. And I'll try to talk a little bit about some other benefits we see for, for soils in our research plots. Next slide, please. So, um, Cover crop have the potential to tackle multiple production and sustainability challenges that you might be encountering in your orchards. And this is thanks to a combination of shifts, both um, above ground and below ground, and enhancing the potential beneficial um, ecological interactions that are occurring in, in the orchards. So cover crop, um, as Elena should have pointed out um, and will point out uh, later, uh, can help foster above ground organisms, including pollinators, and creating a competitive environment for pest control um, when it comes down to weeds and natural predators. But also, um, it can have large impact below ground. Um, this is one of the most effective soil health building practice uh, that we have, along with compost application. Um, and it can really boost benefits obtained from, from soil, um, including some very unique and difficult to manage interaction with, with soil microbes. Next slide, please. So, 
and that's my own thinking here. I think so. Talking to growers um, and their advisors, uh, increasingly we see that soy health is actually limiting almond production. Um, and I think that comes from various surveys where growers are increasingly concerned about infiltration of their irrigation water, salinity issues, compaction issues. Um, and and we see some real benefits of, uh, in terms of yield at least, of rebuilding soy health in almond orchard. And um, orchard right now, uh, uh, alleys are really underutilized. We actually call um, a soil, uh, a living soil, a floor. And about 5% of the surface area have a winter uh, cover uh, in almond across California. So we have a huge opportunity to intensify soil services. And growing cover crop in alley represents a, a fantastic opportunity for cover cropping using uh, winter post-harvest um, as an ideal time to grow some biomass uh, with precipitation when tree are dormant and we have our precipitation water available. Um, and so that has some potential benefit to help grower adapt to new environmental conditions, new constraints to production, but also, as I mentioned, tackle both production and, and sustainability challenges. Next slide, please. And this is, oh sorry, this is a bit messed up. Um, and this is because healthy soy have a capacity to do multiple things. Um, first, healthy soy can build and store carbon, and this is uh, very important to help mitigate climate change and adapt to climate change. Healthy soy cycle and provide nutrients to help conserve water, uh, mitigate erosion losses, but also support diverse and active soil microbes. And, and we see some potential impact on yield and input use efficiencies um, as well. Next slide. So I'm um, just going to talk quickly about some results on soil health we obtained from, from a project that has been going on for um, three years, uh, where we've planted in um, um, two different popular mixes uh, that have been developed for different objectives from Project Apis. One is a soy mix and the other one is a pollinator mix. Um, uh, one has mostly brassicas and the other has brassica, grass and a legume mix. And we tried those mixes in replicated trials at uh, three different orchards, uh, four different orchards across the valley, and compared it to perennial uh, resident vegetation that is mowed and or bare soil. Um, next slide, and and we um, at those. Um, as at those trial sites, uh, we conducted an interdisciplinary evaluation of the impacts, um, and I'll focus on, on yield and soil health um, today. Next slide. So what have we learned? Um, well, first we've learned that cover crop is a feasible, flexible rain-fed practice. This is the kind of cover we got in Tehama, Merced, and Kern County. Um, so just using winter precipitation, no supplemental irrigation, you can um, have a fairly good soil cover um, and a, a bloom um, in, in your orchard. Uh, it can be uh, a small strip in the middle or it can extend to the tree line. My recommendation would be to keep the berm free of, of um, vegetation um, to avoid potential competition for, for water. But overall, um, we've had some very good growth just using wister precipitation across the three regions. Next slide. So uh, as Billy mentioned, um, um, it, it can be um, implemented quite easily. It does need a bit of care and you do have to treat it a little bit as a crop. Um, uh, we've tried um, six to ten feet strips um, planted with a no-till drill or cedar, uh, mostly seeding end of October, beginning of November, without um, supplementary irrigation uh, in orchards with micro sprinkler. In terms of termination, um, most cover crops have terminating end of March, beginning of April, and this is a good time to avoid potential competition for water resources. Um, and keep it as a mulch after mowing or uh, use a herbicide. And doing that quite early in the season post bloom, we were able to obtain clean soils at harvest, uh, no need for conditioner, and so no real concerns over harvest condition. Next slide. So um, 
we can keep good harvest condition. It is possible. Um, all of things, all of those things being equal, the more nitrogen in the biomass, the faster it will decompose. So the woodier the biomass, the slower it will decompose. So in other words, legume decompose faster, whereas grasses and brassicas decompose slower. Um, in some of the mixes that are included in this in this program, um, some mixes have a, a very well balanced uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio that would allow for timely decomposition to have um, a clean um, understory at harvest. The key being to terminate promptly post bloom during mowing or or an herbicide. We've seen in our trials over the last three years no negative impacts on yields. On the contrary, um, we see trends uh, that are potentially confirming this year toward yield increases, especially in very compacted orchards. Um, in the second year of a trial done in Kerr County, we had 225 pounds per acre more um, yields. So some uh, real benefits, um, especially um, when soils are compacted, and this is why I'm saying that soil health is, is limiting um, almond production right now um, in a lot of orchards. Next slide, please. Another um, a very tangible benefit that we see across our landscape is the ability of cover crop to help capture, capture and conserve uh, winter rainfall. This is just uh, a picture from uh, two orchards across from each other in Merced County. Um, and we do not need a, a lot of fancy measurements to just see the potential benefits for capturing this winter precipitations. Next slide. But that also, um, um, you can also see this in, in the summer with in-season capture of irrigation water, especially for orchards on micro sprinklers or dual irrigation systems uh, that are in some frost-prone area um, of the states. Um, uh, we see some real impact on infiltration of irrigation water. Um, next slide, please. This is um, the data um, you see here. Uh, so this is a machine on the left that we use. This is an infiltrometer. And I just want to point out um, the picture at the bottom left, uh, which shows um, the difficulty of taking infiltration measurements in orchards in my career. I think I've never seen such compacted soils. Um, nevertheless, we were able to measure improved infiltration. You see uh, the bar, uh, the the um, uh, black bars are soils with um, the soil mix being planted and the gray bars are um, infiltration we measure on the resident vegetation or bare soil across three different orchards and some net benefits here to improve infiltration especially during the cover crop um, season. Conditions tend to revert back to original infiltration rates post cover crop and I think we need to keep in mind that um, those are long-term improvements, uh, but we see less pooling of irrigation water um, and definitely a higher capacity for winter rainfall to penetrate the soil to reduce risk of runoff and, and conserve water. Next slide, please. Another aspect of um, soil health, some other salient um, soil health benefit that we've seen in our trial, um, first is an increase in sodicity. Um, under all the vegetative cover compared to bare soil. Um, so this uh, refers to the amount of sodium you have relating to calcium and magnesium in the water extract from saturated soil paste. Um, so soil that have a high sodicity value um, are characterized by greater dispersion of organic matter and clay particle, reduced um, hydraulic conductivity, so that's a measure of infiltration and aeration, and in general, greater degradation of on soil structure, and really high solidity, solidity, poor aggregation, and high compaction um, are some um, main uh, features of orchard soils. So we see that two years after a growing cover crop, you can have a, high, a, a significant impact on um, your soil structure, um, improvement in soil aggregation, um, but also some very uh, uh, quick shifts in soil biology, and those are site and mix dependent. But some trends we see as early as two years after developing cover crop is an increase in microbial biomass, so you have more of those microbes in your soil. We see a shift in soil food web 
um, and in particular an enrichment in those good guys um, which are put in the bacterial feeding nematodes so you're kind of rebuilding an ecosystem that can provide some real benefits um, for um, your soils um, and um, resource use um, efficiencies ultimately. So um, in conclusion um, Cover crops, through your choice of cover crops, you're going to impact the floral traits, the vegetation, the biomass, but also the root traits um, that um, are being expressed in the system. And this will help um, um, uh, provide multiple other potential benefits in terms of weed control and limited suppression. And we have more data, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any question you might have. Um, now, when we try to reconcile all of those benefits, um, there's potentially going to have trade-offs. For instance, um, a mowing will, in, will improve root growth and might help having more soil benefits, uh, especially when it comes down to creating those, those biopores in the soil. But then you might uh, be impairing your cover crop ability to provide forage for bee health. So, um, it's about managing some of those benefits and trade-offs through careful choices of cover crops and, and management. And cover crop management is key um, to uh, realize the food benefit potential of this practice. Um, last slide, uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, sorry. So next slide. So um, there's a, I just wanted to mention a few new tools that are available to help you manage cover crops. The first one is uh, a preliminary ass assessment of um, economic return um, based on cost benefits. Um, this is a model that uh, you see here on the left um, that has been put together uh, by, by colleagues at, at UC Davis that include um, the cost of seeds, planting, um, termination, labor, um, et cetera, and the potential benefits in terms of soil health, reduced erosion, uh, nutrient cycling, weed control, um, et cetera, and, and um, kind of uh, put a, a model together to give you an estimated return on investment. The second tool um, is a cover crop selection tool that has been put together by, by Shulamit Schroeder down in Kern County. That, um, and I just want to mention that those two tools are still in a development, are still in development, but nonetheless uh, can give you some um, uh, interesting insight at the time to choose how, which cover crop you want to plant and, and how to, to uh, manage it and what kind of return you might be expecting. Last slide. So with that, I'd like to um, uh, thank um, all the researchers, growers, and, and managers that have helped us uh, with, with this project, and, and thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions now or later um, if we have time. Thank you, Emily. Um, next up, we have uh, Lori Davies Adams from Pollinator Partnership. Hi. So thank you, Billy, and uh, thank you, Amelie. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, great. Well, I'm excited to be here to talk to you about bee friendly farming, and not just as it relates to cover crop, uh, but also to the health of farms and the health of soils. But it's especially uh, important, I think, because this is pollinator week. And Pollinator Partnership started uh, Pollinator Week 13 years ago with a proclamation from the US Senate. And it was a unanimous proclamation. That those were the days when unanimous proclamations could be uh, orchestrated. And the way we did it was by calling every US Senator and talking to their ag LAs, their legislative assistants on agriculture. And virtually every conversation started with, well, is this about honey? And that was the start of conversations with every senator uh, in the United States to explain really the broad implications of pollinator health. And here we are 13 years later, and just about everybody in the United States is 
celebrating the fact that pollinators are the topic of the week. It's a very exciting time. So thank you, APSM, for allowing us to come and talk about bee-friendly farming. So next slide. Bee-friendly farming is a certification program that provides guidelines for farmers interested in promoting the health of managed and native pollinators on their lands. But I have to say, when the program began, uh, and it began as a program uh, elsewhere, started by uh, Kathy Kellison and eventually brought to Pollinator Partnership, it really was a program designed specifically to help honeybees and to help beekeepers find places to rest their bees. Uh, the project is evolving. The project now, of course, takes care of native and managed bees, but also, as I said, really helps the farmer. And so it's evolving, much as Pollinator Week is evolving, much as the conversation and the science about healthy pollinators is evolving. Next slide. Bee-friendly farming works directly with farmers and growers to help protect, preserve, and promote pollinator populations. We're talking today specifically about work that we're doing in California, and on the top left is our new bee-friendly farming coordinator, uh, Miles Dakin, who is out talking to farmers and really listening to how, how we can really integrate healthy ecosystems, support for pollinators, and really uh, very, very good crop systems. So next slide. Bee Friendly Farming is a program from us, the Pollinator Partnership, and we deal with a, a lot of pollinator issues, not just in agriculture, uh, and we're the largest nonprofit dedicated exclusively to the protection and promotion of pollinators and their ecosystems. We do about 30 different projects, um, and uh, I hope you'll visit our website, pollinator.org. Next. Bee Friendly Farming has about 850 registered uh, Bee Friendly Farming sites. Uh, we, as I said, are this is an evolving uh, process and we're um, engaging a lot more farmers uh, with direct conversations and uh, visits, and especially here in California, but as you can see, uh, we have European, Asian, African, Oceanic, and even in South America, although the, the dot isn't on there, a lot of people are interested in doing bee-friendly farming. Next. The criteria is fairly straightforward. Uh, to be bee-friendly farming certified, 3 to 6% of the land uh, has to have season-long bloom. Uh, clean water has to be available for pollinators, and the habitat has to have suitable nesting and reproductive sites as well. Next. Uh, in addition, uh, the practice of IPM in order to reduce pesticide use and eliminate the impact of chemicals on pollinators is one of the practices that the farm has to have in place. And then there's a very modest fee uh, to keep uh, certified. And in addition, there is a compliance form that has to be filled out once every three years. Um, this little clip on the left is taken from a new film that's specific to, uh, to almonds in California, and it features a lot of uh, Billy's work from Project APSM. So I hope you'll go to pollinator.org, look at Bee Friendly Farming, and check out this very short film. But I think the best part about the film is it's really farmers talking about their experience, farmers talking to farmers. So uh, please check that out at pollinator.org. Next. Uh, as I said, Bee Friendly Farming is done in partnership with growers. Uh, voluntary sponsorships are available when we take sponsorships from uh, corporations that are interested in promoting this project. Uh, but also from farmers themselves. It's tax deductible, it grows the program, and it supports the Seeds for Bees program of Project APSM. Next. So I've mentioned we're working with Project APSM and Seeds for Bees, but we're also in sync with the Almond Board of California, 
the California Almond Sustainability Program, and the Honeybee Best Management Practices for California Almonds. Those are brochures that are available and programs that are available through the Almond Board of California. Next. So what's in it for the person or the farmer or the grower who decides to uh, work with Bee Friendly Farming? Well, the logo itself is a way to market the sustainability efforts of a farm. It really is a checklist in each farm to do the right activities for sustainability and for protection of pollinators. The possibility exists of increasing profits. Consumers are sometimes willing to pay a premium for sustainably farm products, but often they really just expect these, pro these practices. We have a store uh, where anyone who is registered as a bee friendly farmer can have the merchandise, the signs, the hats, the things that show to the world what you're doing on your landscape. Next. In addition, uh, there is a community. As I've mentioned, there are 850 other growers in a variety of, of crops that are already part of this community. You join this community of like-minded growers from around the world. Monthly, we send out newsletters with relevant news and technical guides, and you can have publicity as well. P2 likes to share the story of the farmer with our audience of over 100,000. Next. Here's how to get involved. I start by looking at the video and visiting the Bee Friendly Farming website. Plant for Pollinators, Pollinator Partnership has free eco regional guides and other land management resources to help you. You can certify your farm and keep your registration up to date. Share your story with us to be featured on the P2 blog. We'd love to hear more. Uh, from the farmer's perspective about many of the benefits that Amelie just described, uh, about water retention, about soil health. Uh, we really think that these are the stories that will resonate with other farmers. And then we're always looking for donations to support and expand our program. And in, in fact, this week, uh, the Cusify company, uh, which provides uh, quality control automated for the almond industry has set up a challenge grant for us and everything that's donated this week will be doubled by the Cusify, uh, Cusify company. Next. So I've mentioned a lot about Bee Friendly Farming. Uh, you can find everything at BeeFriendlyFarming.org. At Pollinator.org, there are a lot of programs that also might be of interest, including those eco-regional guides. But we're also here. You can reach out. We're here to help you. I mentioned Miles Dakin, our new uh, Bee Friendly Farming Coordinator. This is his web, his internet uh, uh, address and my email address. You can reach out to us anytime. Uh, we're here to help, and we're delighted to be working as closely as we are with the Seeds for Beads program and uh, with Project APSM. Thanks, Billy. Thank you, Lori, for that. Um, if we've got Alina, we could do her slides now. If not, we can move on to uh, Hi, some Bill. questions. Okay, oh, okay. Right, there. Okay, yep. I am there. Yeah. Yep. Great. Thank you about, uh, thank you for the patience while we sorted out the technology that worked and then didn't work. Uh, but hopefully everybody can hear me and I know we're a little bit behind, so I'm just gonna jump right into it and Billy, I'll just tell you next, obviously, when you um, need to switch the slides. So um, good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank Billy for inviting me to present to you a little bit of work that we've been um, conducting here in California, specifically in almond orchards, and as it pertains to bees, um, honeybees specifically, and the health and how the nutrition can help support honeybee health, as well as a couple other projects that I just want to talk about briefly um, that might be of interest to you as well. Next, please. So as Billy already pointed out, there are a lot of things that are actually um, challenging the honeybees today. 
I'm not going to go over each one of these, but the idea is that the nutrition can actually help buffer quite a few, or proper nutrition can help buffer quite a few of these issues that the honeybees and the beekeepers are having to deal with. Next. So, for example, we know uh, now from several different uh, labs, research labs working on honeybee health, we know that better nutrition can improve the immune system of the honeybee and detoxification responses, which basically means that honeybees are better able then to deal with a variety of pathogens, even parasites and pesticides as well. Next. So one of the projects that we started off back in 2018, and we worked with uh, Project APSM on this, as well as Dr. Neil Williams, we wanted to see uh, once these additional forage crops are planted, what does it actually do for the honeybees? So is it very useful? Do honeybees improve in health? Indeed, and not only short term, but also over a long term uh, time period. So for the purposes of gravity, I will point out that we did test the Project APSM's mustard mix, uh, but we also tested the wildflower mix that was developed by uh, Neil Williams here at UC Davis. And again, for purposes of this presentation specifically, I will focus only on the mustard mix and some of the results that we found uh, with this specific uh, forage crop. Um, so what we've done, we actually uh, tested honeybees or evaluated honeybee colonies in the mustard uh, crops within the almond orchards and compared them uh, to other colonies that were only present within the, uh, or only had access to almond pollen. Next. And we evaluated these colonies for a variety of different uh, parameters or uh, metrics, one of these being the adult bee population. So basically the numbers or uh, the amount of frames that are containing the adult uh, worker bees. Among those, of course, are the forager bees as well. So Billy already talked a little bit about the positive feedback loop with the foragers going out, bringing pollen back in, uh, producing more brood, and then that actually requiring and sending a signal for uh, needing more pollen, and then more po more foragers being recruited to go out and bring back more pollen. So this is indeed what we actually saw when it came to the adult bee population. Um, you can see the two stars above showcase where the uh, there was a higher amount of adult bees within the uh, colonies that were present with the mustard forage crop as comparison with just almonds. And this is really something that was also reflected, although it's not shown here, but it was also reflected in the brood production. So again, those colonies were increasing in strength, thereby most likely producing a higher and stronger foraging force that was going out to collect pollen and therefore uh, pollinate the almonds. Next. Another thing that was really important to uh, us to view and also beekeepers and what they want to know specifically is what about the survivorship of the colony? It is great that the colony is actually growing and it's coming out um, out of almonds strong and stronger, but what happens long term? So we tracked these colonies over several months, of course not in almond orchards, we brought them back to um, UC Davis. We tracked the colonies for survivorship and we did see uh, increase or decrease in survivorship in those colonies that did not have access to the mustard crops. This is only uh, as far as uh, about five months, but what was really striking to us is, and it's not shown here, in November, when we did our last checkpoint for the survivorship, um, the colonies that were present in with the mustard in almond orchards, in fact, had a higher number of frames of bees going into the winter, and there was a much higher survivorship of those colonies in November. So all of these things are very positive. And of course, you want to have strong colonies going into the winter, which means that they have a higher chance of surviving the winter and have a higher chance of being stronger colonies when they're then going back into the almond crop to uh, pollinate the following uh, February. Next. One thing that we wanted to take a look at with our collaborators that could potentially lead to a negative uh, impact on survivorship of the colonies is, of course, presence of pathogens. Pathogens uh, that we looked at were deformed wing virus, 
black queen cell virus and several other viruses, as well as the microsporidian or nosema uh, prevalence, which is a fungus that can negatively affect the colony and actually crash the colony, but can benefit from higher uh, uh, or better nutrition. Interestingly, we didn't see differences uh, when it came to a level of pathogen, uh, pathogen load in these different colonies that were present in mustards with almonds or uh, just almond uh, orchards. But again, this all goes back to the fact that despite the fact that they had the similar pathogen loads, colonies that had access to mustard plantings earlier in the season seemingly had a higher resilience towards the end of the year's year also and were better able to survive. But I wanted to add this in here because I just wanted to cover a couple other things, a couple other projects that uh, are potentially of interest to you. And I also view it as something where we're not putting it all on just the growers to, uh, for, to uh, plant the additional forage to support honeybee health, but the beekeepers and the researchers are also doing quite a bit on our own side, on our own part to support uh, bee health. So next. One of the things that the beekeepers have been more and more interested in, and again, us as researchers have been interested in looking into this, are the addition of probiotics to honeybee colonies. So thinking about the nutrition as a whole, so not just whatever they're bringing up from the outside, but can we support honeybee health as well through use of probiotics? And this is work that we've been uh, collaborating on with a, a group from uh, University of Western Ontario in London. And we have uh, collaborated with Dr. Gregor Reed and Brendan Daisley. We set up a full trial here last year, 2019, and went through the uh, um, evaluation of the honeybee colonies. And this is uh, stemming from the idea that the probiotics that uh, Brendan was using for the colonies, if you look at the uh, graph that is top uh, left on the side, you can see that once the colonies were fed these probiotics that Brendan had, they actually had a lower um, prevalence of the American fowl brood pathogen, which is a terrible pathogen and that causes the beekeepers to actually have to burn their hives. So adding these probiotics actually help the bees uh, uh, deal better with this pathogen and reduce the amount of the pathogen present in the colonies. So again, um, next, we um, wanted to support this work and study and see how this translates into California because of course uh, the environment can have quite a bit of work to do uh, with how the various probiotics impact the health and stay tuned for the results of work here at UC Davis. We already have seen some uh, promising results in terms of increase in um, honey production when these probiotics are present in the lab. Next. And the last thing I wanted to touch on, which is not necessarily directly related to uh, honeybee nutrition, but it is indeed a crucial part of sort of supporting honeybee health and also supporting the crop health is uh, the fact that we know that some pesticide could potentially pose a risk to pollinators. Um, and one of the things that we have been working here uh, with our collaborators at UC Davis, and some of you might even be familiar with Flo Druias, who is a, a specialist down at Kearney, and also Dr. Rachel Vanett, who is a, a professor here at UC Davis, We've been searching for uh, additional biocontrol agents for a variety of diseases, specifically for this uh, purpose, we're talking about brown rot in almonds, which if you're an almond grower, of course, might be of great interest to you. Next. Um, so we've been focusing again as a, a team on discovering these new novel biocontrol agents for pathogens. And we have been successful in um, identifying over 250 different microorganisms that would have potential as a brown rod control agent. And we have also been working together to test some of these agents for a potential negative impact on honeybees, because of course, before you release any of these biocontrol agents as a greater integrated pest management tool, uh, we wanted to ensure that these are not affecting honeybees negatively as well. So far, we have tested um, uh, several different uh, potential biocontrol agents, and we have good candidates showing that these are not 
first of all, they are successful at uh, suppressing the monolinia or the brown rot, and they're also not, not negatively impacting honeybee adults or larval stages. So that's very exciting to me and one of the uh, projects that I've been sort of working on for a while now, and it ties back into the pollination of uh, these various crops, again, specifically almonds in this case, is using honeybees that are already in your orchards pollinating your crops as delivery agents for these biocontrol uh, uh, microorganisms. Next. And the way this works is basically that a bee that would go out to forage and pollinate your crop would walk through a dispenser that contains the biocontrol agent. And you can see in the lower right corner, that is a bee that uh, is has fuzzy legs. And uh, that all white powder on the bee is actually the biocontrol agent mixed with some starch. Uh, the bee flies out, delivers these biocontrol agents to the flowers while foraging and has the potential to control the pathogen. So um, again, 10 minutes is uh, quite a short time to sort of give the uh, great uh, detail of what we're doing here at UC Davis to support not only beekeepers, but of course the growers of various crops that uh, bees pollinate. So if you do have any questions, I welcome you to uh, email me as well. Um, Billy, I believe you are able to share our my email address for sure. Um, so you can uh, contact me because I know that we're running out of time. And Billy, if you just want to click next, I just want to make sure that I thank a variety of our um, students and variety of the lab assistants in the uh, lab that have worked hard on several of these projects. And I want to thank, of course, Project APSM and the California Almond Board for, as well as the California State Beekeepers Association, USDA, for supporting these projects in terms of um, funding. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alina. Um, so we're about to be at the top of the hour. Uh, we had a question about frost and frost risk. And I think Amelie's uh, great to answer that. So um, we're going to get questions for Amelie or Lena or Lori answered first. Um, they are welcome to stay on if they want, but I will definitely be staying on. So yeah, Amelie, uh, you want to address uh, frost? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. So. Um, what we see in our um, trials is that cover crops help help um, buffer temperature. So basically, the top soil temperature were cooler under cover crop, um, and we observe no ambient air temperature difference at three to five feet. So you see, really at the soil surface, cooler temperature under cover crop but we see no differences at three to five feet where the buds would be so um this is from one year of data so things have to be put in perspective here um but uh cover crop orchard may not experience higher frost risks um but it could keep soils cooler Definitely mowing and irrigation for, for for frost control can still be done anytime and um, considering a low growing cover um, might be a good idea in in frost prone areas such as sub clover for instance um, so yeah that's kind of what we see in our trials regarding frost great thanks Amelie um, we have a question about what, what is your experience with establishing cover crops in the southern San Joaquin Valley during dry winters a very good question because we'd like for growers all over the state to dry cover crops but in reality there's a gradient into which it's easier than uh, there's other places that you know it's, it, it's easier for example where there is more rain mm -hmm. so we have a lot of growers um, in the San Joaquin Valley that are able to grow cover crops, it is more challenging when they have a dry winter. Uh, irrigation is a nice way to get it started. So an, an ideal year with, with 
decent rain, you don't need to irrigate these these cover crops at all. But for example, last year it didn't rain till the end of November. Well, if you're able to irrigate it before that to start germinating the seed, then the winter rains take over. We also had a, a record breaking dry February. So you may need to give it uh, one or two drinks of water if the rain stopped for a time. Um, so growers in the drier part of California, they are less able to experience that, you know, that high level of success every year because of that, uh, that drier climate and the, the non-reliable uh, amount of rainfall. Um, how do successful cover crops impact orchard floor temperatures during frost? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, uh, Alina, or uh, Amelie addressed that. Um, yeah, Grace, do we have any other questions? Oh, I see there's a question about minimum acreage. There's not, if you're a commercial grower, um, I would definitely encourage you to apply. There is not uh, uh, necessarily a minimum amount for anyone on the commercial scale. Some growers, um, want to start out real small and i if, if, if you're t tenuous i suggest that you know dip your toe in first to the water to, to see how it is before you ju jump jump in if that means you just want to do a couple of rows on one of your orchards and see how it works and expand from there great so i encourage everyone to apply um it is california specific um, oh, Billy, could I could I add something to that? Sure, uh, absolutely. As this is Pollinator Week, uh, there is also a special program that's been announced this week by the Almond Board of California called their B Plus Scholarship, and it is a way that the Almond Board is going to support uh, both seeds for bees and bee friendly farming with a hundred. Uh, almond growers. So it's a perfect time if you want to get your toe in the water, as Billy. Uh, stated to really check out that program at the Almond Board of California. Thank you, Lori. And um, Billy, I apologize if you already covered this one, but we had a question. Uh, do you have a suggestion for a good cover crop between taking out and putting in an orchard for soil health that will also help bees in the area? That is a good question. If you have nematodes, my answer is is definitely the mustard. Now I've had worked with a, a couple of growers already that did that exact thing. So um, controlling nematodes with with brassicas with mustards is a little tricky. Uh, you need to to macerate that vegetative matter and incorporate it into the soil as soon as possible. Um, but that that alley, that that middle, is a different environment than the berm. You know, I think there's still a lot of research that needs to uh, happen about it, in an existing orchard. Does that help the nematodes? Is it, does it prevent them from moving around? Um, Amelie, if I have something wrong, feel free to jump in. Um, you know, does that actually affect the the nematodes at the trees? Um, but when you're changing an orchard, you don't really have to worry about that and a lot of times orchard blocks that are blocks that have the trees taken out they're right next to, to mature varieties so i've had growers that will plant a hundred percent of that land with the mustard mix and then in, incorporate it and manage it in a way that's good for uh, killing nematodes for example and then plant that the next year and it's kind of a, a great uh, uh, synthetic chemical free way to control nematodes. If you don't have a nematode issue, I think uh, just about any of these cover crops would work really well. It kind of depends on what your goals are, what your soil type is, and these are all the types of things that we get into in detail on that phone consultation. So if you wanted to fix a bunch of nitrogen, yeah, we'll, we'll do the clover. Um, if you wanted, if it's on a, hillside and you wanted to fix a little nitrogen and stabilize it, I'd probably point you to the soil builder. 
Thank you, Billy. I believe those are all of our questions thus far. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers for joining us. We are just over the hour. Um, I have posted a link to sign up to receive the recording of this webinar for all of our participants. If you're interested, go ahead and sign up. Many of you have asked about um, getting copies of the presentations. We'll have to check with our researchers, but there will be a recording of the webinar. And of course, if you have additional questions, feel free to email myself, Billy, um, and our researchers have also put their emails in the chat. Thank you everyone for attending. I'm always here for questions. Thank you. Thank you.